Well, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Ann Kinseth. I am the Director of Education at the Meadows Museum in Dallas, and it's my pleasure to welcome all of you for our virtual Further Afield program this afternoon. It is my pleasure to introduce our speaker uh, for the hour. So Paula Barrero Lopez is head researcher of the International Platform Modes and professor of contemporary art in the art history department at the University of Toulouse II. Her research focuses on art criticism, cultural networks, and politics in Spain, Western Europe, and Latin America during the Cold War, as well as the diverse and divergent developments of modernity reflected in the art historic accounts within an increasingly globalized world. She's worked at several European research institutions and universities in France, the UK, Switzerland, and Spain, and she has published widely. Among her latest publication is the 2017 Avant-Garde in Criticism in Francoist Spain, and we were so pleased that she contributed an essay to the Meadows Museum's exhibition catalog for our current, current show, In the Shadow of Dictatorship, Creating the Museum of Spa Spanish Abstract Art, which she titled Poetics and Politics in Spanish Abstraction During the Cold War. So it is now my pleasure to turn the presentation over um, for a talk that she has titled Avant-Garde Mili Militant Criticism and the Franco Regime. Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you for the introduction. Do you hear me OK? I hope so. Yeah, uh, you sound great. <laughs> thank you. So it is a great pleasure to be here with you today. Uh, I was uh, very happy that I could contribute to the catalog. Uh, so my thank yous also to Clarice Fava uh, Pitts. Uh, but uh, today I am giving you um, a talk that is going to broaden up a little bit the horizon that my my uh, article for the catalog uh, did. Okay. So and I will be focusing on on the from abundant abundant point uh, that uh uh, close uh, a very close detail on on the work of the art critics uh, that were very important for the development of of um, the modern art in Spain. So if you go to the exhibition, uh, I think this this talk uh, will give you uh, another element to understand the complexities of the period. So I will start. So in uh, wait wait because I need to say yeah yeah. Um, in 1962, uh, Antonio Jiménez Pericas, a Valencian art critic deeply involved with the avant-garde movements in Spain. There is a problem with, yeah, maybe, I sorry. So he was a very close, uh, uh, an art critic who was very close to, to the avant-garde movements in Spain was arrested for political activism, along with several politicians of the clandestine Communist Party and artists such as uh, Agustin Ibarrola and Maria da Pena that you can see on the screen. All of them were accused of military rebellion and were judged under the martial laws that the dictator General Francisco Franco has imposed uh, upon Spanish territory when he won the Spanish Civil War in 1939. During the summary trial, the prosecutor as Jimenez Pericas, why do you cross the line when you talk about things as vague as art, a topic one is allowed to discuss in Spain? And this, uh, we know that because they did a publication that was clandestine, uh, giving all the, the information about the, the interrogations uh, and of the prosecution. So we know what the, was the response uh, done by, by Jimenez Pericas. He said, for me, art is not an ethereal question. It has a political meaning. So by that time, he was already a member of the clandestine Communist Party of Spain and had been involved in anti-Francoist political activism since the 1950s, in completely opposition to the officially endorsed autonomous understanding of art Pericas, uh, for Pericas, ethics and politics were considered as co-substantial with uh, artistic processes. And so his direct answer conveyed the feeling an understanding of great many artists uh, in Spain, critics and intellectuals. And in fact, his words represented the entanglement between art and politics that developed within the avant-garde in Spain during the 1960s that had included the avant-garde within the cultural forces against the dictatorship. So in 1962, the situation in Spain 
has evolved a lot since 1939 when Franco won the war. And after more than one decade of isolation and rationing, the regime went through a modernization processes that make its entry into the Western camp of the Cold War and into a capitalist model. The new strategy, strategic position of Spain as ally of the US entailed the realignment with the West's most powerful democracy, not only in the geopolitical sphere, but also in the cultural one too. Modern art became part of the official international cultural policies from this moment on, and Spanish abstraction emerged alongside the Francoist process of institutionalization and integration in the Western Bloc, operating within a dictatorial regime that bases power on the exercise of repression and censorship. New transnational alliances and the acceptance of the Spain regime by the Western powers endorsed by the famous hug between Franco and Eisenhower that you can see there at the Madrid airport in 1959 had a clear impact on the dictatorship entrenchment at home. And But if these processes were accompanied by economic growth that importantly led Spain into the era of consumer society and a phase of social transformation, the regime could not longer hide its contradictory nature, demonstrating at the same time its extraordinary capacity to adapt a system of conservative and fascist roots to the modern world, as well as its sclerosis vis-a-vis -vis, um, an unsatisfied society that began to demand more and more liberties and civil rights. This growing movement of contestation deeply affected the cultural field in the 1960s, not as workers, but also many intellectuals, art critics, artists would increasingly take an active position in the social and political sphere. So this lecture aims to describe the creation and development of this perspective, and also to analyze the inevitable processes of negotiation uh, it entailed amongst art critics uh, and cultural agents during the late dictate, uh, Franco dictatorship, which is mostly between 1959 to 1975. This period, the late dictatorship, late uh, Francoist dictatorship, um, characterized by rapid modernization, the internationalization of Spanish modern art, as well as the creation of new artistic institutions as the Museo de Arte Abstracto de Cuenca, where you can see right now the rich collections at the, at the museum, would as well trigger a reflection about the nature and role of culture within a changing society. In the artistic sphere, a new debate emerged uh, over questions concerning the link between art and left ideology, analyzing the role that the avant-garde could and should play in the social sphere. Such debate was in large part initiated by the group of art critics, including the mentioned Antonio Jimenez Pericas, but also others that you can see on the screen. Uh, that they are my point of focus today as a vantage point uh, from which to discuss how the avant-garde operated on the cultural and socio-political grounds in a moment of opening up of the dictatorship that marked the contradictory beginning of the Spanish modern art internationalization. So this brings me to my first point. I have three points. And the first point is catching up with the avant-garde, the militant criticism. So at the 1958 Venice Biennial, Spanish modern art received worldwide recognition with the presentation of the informal art uh, movement, the informalismo, that gave several prizes to the Spanish pavilion. Uh, it was a selection of artists that you must understand. It was supported uh, by the regime and within a new policies of um, cultural policy of uh, new defense of abstraction. So uh, at the same time, in the same biennial, there was another prize that was very less, less uh, no, uh, known at the time. Uh, so there is this uh, art critic, Vicente Aguilera Cerni, quite unknown at the time. He came from Valencia, and he actually won an international prize for art criticism. So these prizes uh, and this international recognition that would motivate the strong implication of the regime uh, on the international sponsoring of modern art from the 19th 
the late 1950s onwards may visible the interest of um, on the Spanish cultural war by the international community, an interest that was greatly raised by the effective connections that from mid 1950s onwards, by the ending of the autarky, institutions, but also individuals like art critics and artists build with foreign colleagues in professional networks. At the same time, Spain was granted a seat in the international world politics with the backing up of uh, by the US. Spanish artists and art critics benefited from a, a greater permissiveness uh, in issuing passports uh, and from more permeable frontiers. So this motivated their the, the cultural interests and also motivated by ideological ambitions and desire to connect with the international avant-garde, which was very difficult in Spain because of uh, very conservative tastes. So they would start to travel. I mean, there you have Vicente Aguilera Cerny in an airport and their focus would widen. Uh, aesthetic debates uh, taking place in Europe and the Americas found their way to the Iberian Peninsula and art criticism began to incorporate new methodologies and concepts and ideas. Those connections became vital to the renewal uh, of their theoretical tools and their understanding of critical activity within a model called militant criticism, which was a model that uh, was uh, quite spread over uh, Europe in the 1960s. And by 1968, the French art critic Michel Ragon was defining it as a comrade in arms in a faction or even the leader of a gang. So, if for Michel Ragon, it was the French art critic Pierre Restani, the epitome of this kind of criticism, the Spaniards became familiar with such model of criticism through other networks that passed through Italy, especially through the context uh, with, uh, that they had with uh, Giulio Carlo Argan, who was an art professor from the Universita La, La Sapienza in Rome, but also a very powerful art critic at the time. And he was a very close friend of Vicente Aguilera Cerny was deeply convinced, uh, Argan, of the value and the revolutionary character of the avant-garde, and he pushed the limits of critical work towards an active and political position within the avant-garde movements. For him, the art critics should, side by side with the artists, contribute to the society in which he was living in, supporting the value of the new, the revolutionary and the ideological character of the artistic tendencies. And the critic, though, is not just one someone who supported the avant-garde, but he, the, the critic would get involved at the very origins of the production. Underlying this concept was the idea of a form of criticism that would apply its power before new tendencies had emerged. This actually turned the critic into an active agent of the avant-garde, and so it was a counter concept to the widely acknowledged function of criticism as a descriptive or detrimental activity. Accordingly, the militant critic should develop his role as theoretician in close collaboration with the avant-garde, shaping the dispersed work of several artists. And so he, we, they, they imagine this critic as a create, creative partner of, of the, of the avant-garde, in this case, a comrade in arms, or even a leader of artistic tendencies. And of course, uh, Pierre Restani was a, a very good example of this kind of, of art critic, because he created this movement of, of new realism, and he signed the manifesto uh, as, at the same time, like the artist, or he has this, this really central role. But uh, for Argan, uh, being a comrade in arms had more deeply consequences. The art critic shared a social responsibility with the artist because he was applying, applying artworks to the specific social reality in which he operated. This function as, and I quote uh, Argan, technician of aesthetic uh, judgment and enjoyment was essential in the cultural world but was connected to a political and ideological stance that was always the basis of Argan's concept of militant criticism. Though there is this, this political active role that uh, for Argan, uh, this kind of critic had. So in the light of the authoritarian and fascist rooted dictatorship that Spain had been enduring since the start of the Second World War, it is not strange that some of the most active art critics were convinced that this particular way of criticism was the best option for active, 
acting in their specific political and social situation. Appropriating, discussing, and adapting the model of militant criticism, they were deeply implicated in the development, creation, and even direction of the avant-garde tendencies that grew exponentially during this period of Spanish history. The affinity for the militant model had gone hand in hand with a growing interest in contemporary artistic tendencies. And for example, Aguilera Cerny, Pericas, Tericia Moreno Galvan had started their work as art critics, mostly supported the avant-garde movement and being a, a fierce supporter of, of uh, abstraction and of the informal. Uh, by the late 1950s. All of them, they had uh, been born during the, the Republican years and they had knowledge if not personal experience of the intellectual resistance during the civil, Spanish Civil War. And um, they started <clears throat> without a, a proper background in our history, but they started working connected to um, institutions uh, founded by the regime. Some, for example, they were phalanges uh, uh, when they were very young, and uh, they will uh, start to write for phalanges journals at the beginning. However, they would progressively distance themselves from these governmental initiatives, becoming part of an active cultural left in the 1960s, and finally mentoring a new type of uh, dissident intelligentsia. And so the same process we can see with the artists, that, that they go through a process of uh, political conscientiation against the, the regime. Within this context, the younger art critics, Tomás Llorens and Valeriano Bozal, there was younger, there were sons of the war and the post-war years and joined them in collaboration with the new avant-garde movements. And they were collaborating between among them, actually, all these critics. So these uh, younger critics, they had other backgrounds. They had, um, they went to university, they studied philosophy or uh, art history. And so uh, they they were very um, uh, close to the, the linguistic turn and semiotic turn that happened in the 1960s. So they started to apply new uh, methodological approach to the way of they wrote about art and they saw art. But despite the difference between them and actually uh, they will uh, have um, a, a very strong discussion at the end of the dictatorship, all of them, they were actually collaborating at the beginning of the 1960s, and they share a concept of criticism that presupposed an active role for the critic in the avant-garde, okay? So this role entailed what? Entailed firstly cooperation with artists and participation in the creative process. Hence, the work of these critics was developed, developed side by side with the avant-garde in which they became deeply involved. They developed a very close relations with artists who found in them the necessary support they urgently needed in a country with lack of structures and taste uh, of modern art. And in the late 1950s, uh, Aguilera Thernig was saying that actually he started to, to write essays because there was a demand of the artists uh, to, to have people write about them and to have people that could help them not to uh, to be visible. So in this way, from the end of the 1950s to the end of the dictatorship, artists and art critics merged their avant-garde ambitions. The latter became active members and theoreticians of uh, artistic avant-garde groups and movements, collaborating in building a theoretical background for the artist's work and decisively shaping their aesthetic discourse. In short, they became the fundamental theoreticians of the avant-garde movements that to a large extent shape cultural life during late Francoism. And for example, when I'm saying that they were collaborating is that they were part of the same groups with the artists. For example, El Paso that you can see at the exhibition right now, uh, Aguilera Cerny signed the first manifesto. They were fundamental, Aguilera Cerny, Jiménez Pericas, and Moreno Galván, for the uh, support and the participation that the creation of groups that support the, um, uh, the geometrical abstraction. And also they were behind also um, the, the, the realist turn that happens in the 1960s with the Stampa Popular or uh, with um, the, the development of the new figuration. So most of these critics, this was the case, especially of Bodal, Bothal and Jorans, Jorans, were actually being part of these movements in a very, very close, close uh, way with the artists. Yeah, some of the, of the groups that we will see. So 
this position as militant critics entail as well an implicit desire to influence and lead artistic movements in aesthetic and ideological directions. And this something that uh, Aguilera Terni hoped for is to ideologize the artistic activity. Uh, so like the Italians, the Spaniards consider criticism to be deeply implicated in the social political sphere and by promoting and theorizing about artistic tendencies and joining and even leading them, the Spanish art critics were able to participate in the creation and development of artistic avant-garde movements, which allowed them to reinforce their ideological stance as dissident, dissident intellectuals against the dictatorship, uh, the support of the avant-garde went hand in hand with cultural and political activism. And here, sorry, I, I, I forgot that uh, they were also, for example, like Lera Cerny created uh, the late 19, 1960s, a new movement that supported uh, geometrical abstraction that you can see also at the exhibition. And so you see their, their implication was, uh, was strong. And uh, I don't know if it's so visible when you see the exhibition. This is why I thought that uh, telling you this story from, from the point of view also of the critics in order to understand the, the collaborative practices that took place in Spain uh, at that time. So. Um, this leads me to my second point, which is catching up with the zeitgeist, the massization of art criticism. So in the 1960s, the militant critics, along with great many intellectuals and artists, opted for an active role also in the social and political sphere. Taking the slogan of nulla estetica sine etica, no aesthetics without politics, as a banner, they participated in the general opposition movement that understood culture as an instrument in the fight for intellectual and ideological hegemony and urged social and political commitment against the regime. A progressive implementation of Marxist ideology in dissident culture had a clear influence on this process. It provided the forces of the opposition with the theoretical tools for arming the self, themselves against the dictatorship. As this ideology was the old enemy of the regime and could not be developed openly in the country in the years following the coup d'etat, it remained underground until 1963. So you have to understand that uh, uh, the Com Marxism, communist, of course, was the anathem, and um, uh, already showing interest in this kind of ideology was completely forbidden and will entail sometimes even uh, prison sentences. But by the 1963, with the, um, a, a movement of protest that starts in, in Spain, so this kind of ideology was uh, uh, that that uh, actually was underground, uh, actually was more or less general in the in the left uh, 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 at the time no so uh, the, the marxism represented uh, the dominant culture of the left wing democratic opposition in spain and even though the approach was not to this philosophical political and social cultural theory was not always very profound and analytical because it was very difficult to to develop openly this kind of uh, debates it had become the more foremost ideology uh, widespread among students intellectuals art critics artists workers as well as progressive sectors of the clergy you have also to understand that uh, the, the clandestine Communist Party was one of the most strong forces um, galvanizing anti-Francoist uh, activism. So the, the connections are clear, but uh, they had a lot of people that they were not part, actually, the, the Communist Party, but they were like fellow companions, as, as they say. So during the, the 1960s, a great number of intellectuals uh, and artists and our, our critics like we have here, without necessarily having a formal affiliation to any of the clandestine Marxist organizations that started to appear in the 1960s, found on Western Marxism new perspectives from which to analyze their own situation in a society lacking freedom of speech, liberty of press, or even uh, right of association. Marxist theories had in fact offered the cultural forces of the opposition useful theoretical tools in their ideological battle for cultural hegemony against the dictatorship. And this practice was the first step, not just for fostering contemporary cultural production, but also for developing a civic stance within society. And in the context of the artistic and cultural scene of Franco's dictatorship, 
such, such understanding had dissident implications, and there were already in the 1960s uh, debates about the aesthetical uh, the ideas of Marxism, and that they were, of course, our critics that were well aware of that. So why it was important? On the one hand, because it was uh, this introduction of Marxism was in direct opposition to the apolitical and autonomous interpretation of the arts, clearly established and acknowledged since the 19, late 1940s, beginning of the 1950s, uh, that had been cunningly developed into a governmental strategy, especially since the, uh, the government started to develop a um, uh, cultural policy uh, that supported modern art and then supported modern art as, as far as uh, it was uh, an apolitical and arts for our sakes movement. So um, what they could do is that to transform completely this interpretation of art, um, they could transform completely the critical methods in Spain, providing a new set of questions and reference for studying and analyzing the works of art. So suddenly uh, new parameters of analysis could appear, questions of production system, the market, social classes, questions, questions of hegemony. So suddenly the artworks were part of a very complex social political environment. I have to say, maybe you notice, that a blind, blind spot of, of these art critics, that they were all men, as you see, uh, connected to the very conservative and patriarchal uh, situation and uh, historical situation in, in, in Spain, uh, they were completely, uh, um, they didn't understand and they didn't think on, on uh, Marxism through a gender uh, analysis. Uh, and this is interesting because they had, they were collaborating with women artists, uh, some women artists like, for example, uh, Anna Peters, who was actually the wife of Thomas Jurens. And she, as you see in the screen, she was actually thinking about the stereotypes of, of femininity in, in um, uh, in mass media society, but this kind of interpretation was completely not interesting at all. For having a, a feminist approach, this will happen uh, at the end of the dictatorship by another generation. And because one thing that they, they say, all the women that they were militants at the time is that uh, Marxism was quite patriarchal and they said, okay, first let's liberate ourselves from the dictatorship and then other, other fights will come. So it's quite interesting how they didn't see that. No? But anyway, the introduction of Marxism allowed them to really make a much more complex uh, analysis of the artworks. And on the other hand, it provides uh, the means for an anti-Francoist activism that took place along the same path as the ideological uh, theoretical Marxization. The process of Marxist updating did not only have consequences for the militant critics' comprehension and interpretation of the arts, but also play a defining part in the formation of the art critics and the artists' role as dissident intellectuals. And in fact, this updating to Marxism underpin the demands for social commitment of the arts as well as the active participation within the social political sphere. This is very clear. Uh, more they are in deep into the, their Marxization, let's say that, more activists they become. And so they will actually participate in a very open way in this in dissident this movements for democracy, sometimes in public protest. And for example, uh, Jimenez Pericas was incarcerated and Ibarrola for supporting the, the strikes in 1962. They will support the demands for peace, for amnesty. Uh, they will participate. In, in activities, cultural activities that support the, um, the memory of the Republic that was considered uh, uh, very uh, problematic by the dictatorship and a lot of police, they will go into these activities because they saw that they were uh, creating a space for political activism. A lot of things that they did, they signed uh, letters that they were sent to the government and they used their foreign contacts uh, because they had a quite a privileged position for their international uh, networks in order to uh, help to raise awareness about the Spanish situation. So this international in, in interconnection that the architects had was used, of course, to 
to uh, connect with the international world, uh, to, to international debates, but also they use these networks in also to raise awareness. And so, for example, some you see some uh, letters, one, for example, because it's connected to what I talked at the beginning, one letter supporting in order to ask him for the release of uh, Antonio Jimenez Pericas and Agustin Ibarrola that was signed in, at the Venice Biennial, and you have all these artists, international artists that were signing, and, and then these letters were sent to the to the government to, to put some pressure, and sometimes it, it, it helped a lot. And of course, they will also, here yeah, just to see how many signatures, they will use their, pro, their own means uh, of work, and for example, they organize exhibitions. Uh, for example, this is the exhibition España Libre, that was an exhibition organized in, in contact and collaboration with Julio Carlargan that happened in Italy in the 19, mid 60s that wanted to show actually the artists uh, outside of the reach of the regime as uh, a representative of, of the free Spain and the possibility of free speech and you have uh, a variety of artists that were in contact with the, with the art critics. So these interventions uh, that in the cultural field that were manifold were very close moni monitored by the regime's political police. For example, from the archives here, the, the political police uh, monitor who signed which letter and also the art critics like other intellectuals and artists, you can find reports on the archives about their activities, their interests, ideological relations and some Sometimes there was uh, action, uh, for, for example, uh, in, in the case of Perikas, he went to prison. Others, they were just uh, uh, monitor and they will try to find ways of make their life difficult. And um, for example, in the case of Moreno Galvan, who had strengthened his ties with the Communist Party, he would join the Communist Party, would end with several prison sentences during the 1960s. He was he actually he was provoking almost these kind of sentences by being very plain and very open about his ideological position and his uh, uh, defiance to the regime and um, because and I quote he was convinced that it, it is necessary to fight battles and test them uh, test them the, the regime because he thought it was important to constantly demonstrate that civil society was on the move and the regime, although in power, was losing hegemony. And these kind of um, uh, prosecutions then led to uh, the organization of, of people. For example, this, this uh, poster is a manifestation of artists and colleagues of Moreno Galvan asking for his uh, release, not that I finally went to the Museo del Prado and they did a sitting there. So uh, they were annoying the regime uh, for sure. Uh, this so um, considering um, the characteristic of the militant model, the action of the critics had more repercussions for artistic practice than one could have imagined at the beginning. Working as theoreticians and militant defenders of the avant-garde, the critics' ideas and methodologies were forged directly in the artistic sphere and influenced by their collaboration with the artists. And so this leads me to my third point, which is reshaping the avant-garde. The massization of the militant art critics during late Francoism implied a complete transformation of the definition, the value, and the role of the avant-garde in the Spanish society. If further, a debate about the relations between avant-garde and ideology, which provided the perfect grounds for arguing about desirable ways to transform social and cultural organizations, a concern that addresses the militant critics' own convictions and political experiences. From the late 1950s, the militant critics recover and reshape the concept of the avant-garde, adapting it to their own ideological updating and to the dialects and exchange they were developing with the artists. The autonomous apolitical and formalist consideration of modern art, deeply rooted in intellectual and governmental circles in Spain during the 1950s, evolved within contemporary critical discourse. It eventually lost ground, and thanks to the militant criticism, um, avant-garde, a concept directly linked to the anti-fascist resistance of the 1930s, was rehabilitated. You have to understand that 
in in the second during the 1940s and 1950s even when the regime was started to support the informal artists they never used the term avant-garde they used the term modern art and it's interesting how these art critics they actually take the term avant-garde that comes from the 1930s and has this kind of anti-fascist stance so they call this art avant-garde or second avant-garde understanding it as a collective committed on political activity with an active role in social taxes. So it's interesting because in the 1950s, if um, uh, the phalangist art critic Luis Felipe Vivanco was stating that it's necessary to defend the autonomy of artistic creation vis-a-vis -vis culture, one decade later, 1960, Aguilera Terni was defending the complete opposite, the connection of the arts to the world of ethics. This shift has been initiated at the end of the 1950s within the collaborative project of Arte Normativo, working hand in hand with uh, especially Jimenez Pericas, Moreno Galván, and Aguilera Cerny. This artistic movement was made of different constructivist and abstract groups and designers, as well as individual artists that they were supporting teamwork, anonymity, abstract art, objectivity, mass production, and they understood actually their art artistic practices as participate, participate, ah, sorry, participate, participative, participative agents within social practice. And this is why they were very much interested in design. You see, uh, you have on the left uh, painting by Equipo Cincuentecite, who was at the same time doing this kind of painting, abstract painting, but also this kind of uh, design, furniture design, in order to have this kind of more almost neoplasticity, uh, neoplasticity approach uh, to, to, to art. Following the uh, utopian ambitions of the Russian constructivism, they emphasized the role of the arts in the transformation of the urban, private, and even social landscapes, seeing the avant-garde as a point of origin and eventually uh, social possible aging in the social transformation. So it was in this movement that the basis of an existential Marxism that the critics had absorbed in the late 1950s first became visible, a direct challenge to the regime ideas huh? that was actually art has nothing to do with politics. It's a really completely autonomous sphere. So the massization of the militant critics and the cultural sphere had a determinate impact in on such reconfigurations of meaning. However, even though the new theoretical arsenal that the militant critics acquired during the 1960s facilitated the recuperation of the social and belligerent status already present in the historical avant-garde, uh, for example, the constructivism, it also implied the unavoidable process of negotiation and adaptation within the competing ideologies uh, that define the years of the Cold War. As you know, you know where, where we have this uh, the the, the ab abstraction as the freedom uh, language of of the freedom the free world and uh, realism as the representative of of uh, the other side of the Iron Curtain. So the concept of the avant-garde had to pass through an analytical process in Spain of aesthetic and political adaptation, forcing art critics and artists to adopt positions with regard to the value and nature of the avant-garde after the introduction of Marxist ideas into contemporary debates, especially considering that the Communist Party was quite reluctant, a lot, as a lot of Communist parties at the time, uh, to the avant-garde experimentation and was more interested to figurative and realist uh, works. So I will focus in this last part of the talk in two aspects, an enlarged comprehension of avant-garde and the incarnation of the popular. So trying to conciliate the Marxist input in the experimental work of the artists which, with which they were collaborating, for the critics, the categories of avant-garde and realism were not understood as antithetical, but as flexible concepts with direct connections and reciprocity. Realism went far beyond Aristotelian mimesis. It did not refer specifically just to a naturalistic or even figurative representation of the world because they consider that, I quote, reality is a problem apart from representation. So this is uh, what Moreno said. And actually Moreno Galvan 
was saying that it is necessary to distinguish between reality and representation, seeing the need to overcome the limit concept of realism as a figurative and naturalist representation of the class struggle as the orthodoxy of the Soviet realism as uh, defended. Within this perspective, the category of category of realism could comprise experimental techniques and languages, including the abstract movements in their geometrical and lyric dimensions, hence not only arte normativo, but also the radical and committed perspectives of Saura, Tapies, and Millares informal canvases could be integrated within an open category of realism, what Garaldi called at the time a realism without borders, as well as within the ras ranks uh, of the anti-Francoist forces. Furthermore, the avant-garde was seen in the light of class struggle as a weapon against the bourgeois society that found its most direct representation in the conservative elites of the Francoist regime. Thomas Llorens underlined this idea in 1967, uh, defining avant-garde art by its direct participation in the class struggle and thus in the confrontation with the bourgeois, bourgeoisie and the power elites. Uh, the avant-garde should be don't, uh, understood for Jorens as a counter movement to such power elites, elites and it should be uh, in ideal terms, a manifestation of the aims of the people. That means the working class in which the anti-Francoist struggle was deeply rooted. By this definition, the avant-garde created or should create actually el arte del pueblo, the people's art or the proletarian art. But proletarian was too uh, Marxist, uh, uh, had too, much, too clearly Marxist connotations. So in the Spanish uh, art criticism, they use more uh, people's art. So this question has been a problematic and contested issue within the leftist circles, as, as well as in the militant critics themselves. The search for a proper expressions of the people's art as proletarian art had to be continually negotiated in artistic and intellectual circles. If multiple and competing conceptions of what the people's art meant followed uh, during the 1960s, there was one consensus that no single specific artistic expression was suitable uh, to represent the people. It was possible to endorse the value of different artistic languages ranging from, from the informal paintings of Millares to the figurative ones of Ortega, Ortega as uh, the, the representation of the people, because in both cases, both cases were determined by the collective reality of the time. No, this was the idea behind how how to understand realism and how to understand an art that represents the people. Addressing the specific situation of the working class had been. Uh, behind the passage of a big deal of artists from abstractions to figuration after 1962. And here you have, for example, a painting of Equipo 57 with a, a work of Agustin Ibarrola, who was actually a member of Equipo 57. So you see uh, the radical aesthetical transformation. And this transformation is behind the necessity that the artists felt to represent the realities and the struggles of, 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 of the working class. So finally, by the second half of the 1960s, um, there was the possibility to merge uh, the uh, formal experimentation of the avant-garde with uh, the, the operation in the, the specific context in which they were uh, emerging. And so this is what actually the militant critics understood as uh, a possible realist avant-garde that was at the, at the same time committed, was collective, experimental, and could unify on the one hand, the ideological and the experimental goals uh, of the anti-Francoism. Of all the movements that develop at this moment, uh, it is Equipo Cronica who embodies such, such conception uh, very well uh, of what Thomas Llorens called a realist avant-garde, I quote, uh, an avant-garde, avant-garde realism, gathering the direction of the realist legacy of, all, of our century's art on the one hand, and on the other, the avant-garde, okay? So, Kiko uh, Kronika, who was very close to Tomas Llorens, and for example, his first manifesto was written in collaboration with the art critics, um, had a, a specific uh, type of, of language 
in which uh, he, they quoted citations from the Max Media culture, above all from magazine, photographs, and comics, and they mixed them with satirical juxtapositions of well-known images uh, taken from, from uh, paintings of, of the Golden Age, for example, uh, Velázquez. So, I give you one example here, which is called Desarrollo Histórico and Historical Development. Here, emphasizing a flat adver advertisement-like surface, they employed a figurative language along with distortions of zooms for underlining the narrative sequence of their works with critical aims. Here, the image of the Count Duke of Olivares, who was the minister of Philip IV, uh, the Habsburg, is progressively subjected, subjected to the focus of a zoom, here you have the the the, uh, the image taken uh, from from Velázquez, uh, that transforms the iris uh, from his eye into the Nazi symbol of the swastika. Use a contraposition that reinterprets Beltorrecht's defamiliarization technique. The title, as well as the sequence, search for the activation of the spectator in an intellectual way. Using irony, the image, the image emphasized the discursive strategy that the regime had undertaken since the 1940s to legitimize itself. And um, this is something that uh, was uh, used by the regime, especially to make quotations of, uh, to, to artworks from Velázquez in order to connect uh, uh, his legacy to the legacy of the Hasbur. For example, here, the Escorial, Monasterio de Escorial, uh, of uh, feelings the second, or uh, that actually had kind of reactivations in in modern times. For example, here in the Valle de los Caídos. Uh, but it's interesting that this kind of reconnection with the the Habsburg past is is happening also in the way how uh, they uh, interpret uh, Spanish uh, informal art, for example. So. The, um, however, uh, as the artwork uh, of Equipo Cronica shows, the creation of such a historical continuum was in fact rooted in fascist foundations that had been fundamental for seeking partnership with Germany and Italy for the winning of the civil war and the establishment of the regime itself. So if Equipo Cronica seemed to gather all the elements of the avant-garde supposed supported by the militant critics, this consensus, however, did not last for long. With the increasing appropriation of vanguard movements by a growing art market and the end, or the end of the decade, the militant critics were the, the first to articulate their doubts regarding the capacity of the avant-garde to succeed in its transformative and rebellious aim. And uh, for example, already, uh, um, Vicente Aguilera Cerny, who was really a big supporter and theoretician of Arte Normativo, was saying that, well, by the mid 60s, it was very naive to think that you can transform society to the transformation of art. And they were even more, um, yeah, more clear. Uh, uh, Tomás Llorens and Valeriano Buzal that they saw that if you want to transform society, you need to uh, transform the, stru the structures of the system. It means the, the means of production, the economic power and the social relations. And it's quite interesting because at this point they become very much more clear in their activism, you know, when they understood that. Uh, for example, Tomas Jorayens understood the avant-garde as, as a history of continual failures, as each movement had finally been absorbed by the system that it had initially intended to destroy. However, in this radical criticism, none of these critics, none of the artists, dismissed completely the role that the avant-garde could eventually play in a general social renewal, as in the words of Llorens in 1967, is active participation in the constitution of a new society response to a historical necessity, a point of view that was shared by the general spectrum of the leftist artistic culture and would become hegemonic by the end of the dictatorship. So I arrived to my conclusion. So. Uh, by the end of the dictatorship, the militant critics' notion of the avant-garde had taken root in the Spanish discourse, a visual and conceptual model that was exported to the international arena shortly after uh, Francisco Franco's death, 
So the hegemonic international stage of Benny's biennial provides for those critics the possibility to evaluate the relations between avant-garde and dictatorship uh, with the exhibition España Vanguardia Artística and Realidad Social, Spain uh, Artistic Avant-Garde and Social Reality uh, that took place in 1976. Organized since 1974 and without the participation of Francoist authorities, this is the first time usually the participation at the Venice Biennial was organized by Francoist authorities. This show was in line with the clear anti-fascist objectives of the new Biennial. The Biennial started a new uh, episode in 1974 uh, where they asked to develop a position that was clearly democratic and also anti-fascist. An independent commission composed of young artists, critics, architects, and militant critics, mostly Tomás Llorens and Valerian Botal were this, the, the most important people in this, in this commission, were responsible for the project. At the time, uh, as the time of my talk is almost up, I cannot go into detail about this exhibition that was highly controversial, very fascinating, but um, I think I will, I will raise two points that I think are important for, for the sake of the argument. This exhibition project of the exhibition project of this commission aimed to analyze the development of the avant-garde languages between 1936 and 1976 in the socio-political context. Regarding this talk, it is relevant as the event became the epitome of the militant model. It allowed the critics to confront the Francoist reading of modern art that the regime had exported abroad, emphasizing instead the resistant character of the avant-garde and presenting it as, the, as a faction of the anti-Francoist forces, as part of the anti-Francoist forces. And I don't read my screen right now, but if you read the, the, the quotation, they say they want to analyze and correct. This is interesting. They want to correct the image that the Franco regime has given at the Venice Biennial. It was a very important place to do this, this exhibition. And there was uh, a lot of symbolic elements in this exhibition. One thing is that the, the Spanish pavilion that is uh, uh, belongs to the government was closed, you see, completely closed, and they put an image of the Guernica. And uh, uh, the exhibition took place in the central pavilion. You know, it was in order to make very clear that it was not an official exhibition. With its roots going back to the resistance of the civil war, the avant-garde unfolded into a succession of movements uh, from the, the 1930s, to the 1940s, there you have Tapies, uh, uh, Saura, uh, the, the artists of geometrical abstraction, Estampa Popular, Equipo Cronica, uh, Group de Trebay. So, um, so these artists actually became uh, representatives of the constant class struggle with which defined the years of the dictatorships and that would become clearly visible during late Francoism. And they were the artists with these militant critics were working and collaborating. The whole concept responded to the process of an accelerated massization of the Spanish avant-garde. And in fact, the, Ava, the catalog proposed actually to show that the Spanish avant-garde had been modeled from within by an ideological battle that participated in the class struggle, okay? So although the exhibition incited since its early conception enormous controversy, and criticism, it undoubtedly promoted the militant conception of culture by showing artists and critics as comrades in, in, in arms against the dictatorship. And this is the image that I put at the beginning, if you are curious. Actually, this is um, an installation done by uh, the artists Alberto Corazon and the art critic uh, Tomás Llorens and also Valeriano Bazal, in which they put a wall where they did uh, like a counter narrative of resistance uh, during the whole period of the exhibition, 1936, uh, 1976. And uh, there, in a very precarious way, they put uh, pamphlets of resistance and images of people. Uh, and for example, here you have uh, Jiménez Pericas, the critic, and, and, and uh, Agustín Ibarrola together in this wall uh, of resistance in order to show that the, the Spanish society was fighting uh, all the time against the dictatorship. Um, paradoxically, this exhibition became, on the one hand, a, a presentation of the conquest of the discourse that the partisan critics and artists had built, 
but turn on the other hand also to be its closure. In the uh, and here you have this image of Genovese, not that is seen. You can see there in the on the back. I don't know if you see my pointer. So this is one of the rooms of the exhibition. This is how they to throw away the, the portrait of Franco, but um, the process of transitions were quite different based on a total amnesty that prohibited, of, on the one hand, yes, let the, uh, the political prisoners out of prison, but prohibited any future action against the crimes committed during the Spanish Civil War and the dictatorship. The ideological and militant tone of the exhibition was considered suspicious and was not promoted by the new uh, intellectuals of the transition that sought to dissociate the fields of art and politics. And this is a very interesting cover of the time where you have, instead of, of this image of getting rid of Franco, here you have Franco uh, actually backing you know, the, the, the king and Adolfo Suarez, the first um, prime minister democratically elected. So, I am convinced that returning to the work of these underestimated art critics in their collaboration with the artists offers a vantage point for examining how the avant-garde operated in the cultural and social political field, the close participation of militant critics in the main artistic movements at the end of the Franco regime, their interest in international trends, their gradual updating in the light of transnational theories, and their role in importing them into the Spanish context, converting themselves into true avant-garde theorists, as well as the role in promoting ideologizing and shaping the avant-garde in Spain, offers a complex panorama that allows us to understand some important points. The complex interaction between intellectuals and artists, the implication of political, ideological, and cultural forces, as well as the role of these critics in the circulation of concepts, ideas, values, and positions that participated in the processes of transforming mentalities that took place throughout lay Francoism. Obviously, we had not been able to touch all of these points uh, that are part of my, my last book in English, of which you have a small sample today. Nevertheless, I hope that this talk had been sufficient, sufficient to not only point out, point out the radical role of these critics and uh, theorists and activists, but also to show the active and decisive collaboration of art and culture in the constitution of an ideological, cultural and political consciousness from below on which the democratic processes with all its problems and silence could eventually be built. And this is the end. Thank you very much for your attention. I hope I wasn't too long. Thank you so very much. I think what we'll do now is take um, just a few questions. We're a little tight on time, but at this point, if you have any questions, you can either type them in the chat box or you could certainly type in the chat box that you would prefer to ask them using your voice. I do have a question. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> Hello. Hello, Paula. Th thank you for this fantastic presentation. This was really illuminating, I think, in many aspects beyond the exhibition, but also helping look back at the exhibition and thinking, yeah, we have this group. The, sec the second room of the exhibition is devoted to collectives. And so here, when you mention like art critics being part also of of El Paso and of these very important collectives that was formed. Like I found that was very interesting or even thinking about our painting of Equipo 57 mm -hmm. and, and looking at all the design um, that like you're showing to show how uh, much broader their artistic production was. I think this was many elements that help us kind of look back also at the exhibition and think um, in, in different way more broadly and I mean I have diff many questions but I would say maybe a first one would be about the amazing documentation you've been showing throughout your entire talk and I was wondering even in your in your process as a scholar how difficult was it to access this uh, material this archive uh, I'm, I'm also thinking at the time how the, these art critics were able to publish and, and what were their own channel of, uh, of publication, but you also as a scholar uh, today or when you were working on your book and your, your dissertation, 
um, what were the, the struggles that I could imagine uh, as looking back, going back to the archive? Uh, it's a very good question. Thank you, Clarice. Yeah, well, uh, it depends of the kind of documentation you are looking for. Uh, well, I, I I base my research pretty much in archival documentation, as you can see. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, a lot of some when you are working about the regime, it's quite easy because you have the archival work uh, in the in the in the, the archives, uh, national archives of Spain. So there, for example, I can I could found all these reports on the on the art critics. But then it's quite difficult because this uh, a lot of these uh, archives come are coming from private um, uh, archives, and so you have to really get in contact and create the network in order to be able to find the documents and this is quite difficult and it's a long time and for example for writing this book i could use some of the work that i did for my phd that was about geometrical abstraction and i had to go visiting artists by artists and there i found letters but there you can find the interesting stuff for example uh, at the exhibition espana libre that i show you i found a letter in a private art archive where Aguilera Terni says to the artist, okay, if you participate in this exhibition, you cannot participate in a governmental exhibition anymore. So you have to, so, and this kind of nuances you need to, it's quite difficult. And sometimes you don't, you find the documents and it's great. And sometimes you don't find, and it's like, you are supposing that it's like that. So, but it is interesting that then when you find the documents, sometimes you are, you were right. So this is, this is something that is, uh, um, this is very rewarding. But for example, if you are interested in archives, Vicente Aguilera Terni actually created an archive, uh, but he, you have a lot of information, but honestly, not a lot about himself privately, but there you can find some things. And then uh, the Museo Reina Sofia and some um, art centers, they are buying private archives. But when I was doing the PhD, I, of course, they weren't there. For, but for example, Equipo 57, Team Equipo 57, is a very interesting archive that I had the chance to go there because I, I helped them to organize the archive. And so they had a lot of letters uh, because they were living in different parts of the world so they had to write a lot at the time mm -hmm. and uh, so you can find things and right now it's in Andalusia in, and it's open to the public so I mean uh, it's, it's getting better but it, it is it is difficult it's like a detective work actually and the art yeah. is actually they could publish they published but they they knew that maybe they went to prison or not some were more careful other were more like uh, Moreno Galvan uh, but they had also the support of international colleagues, though. So they are really important critics. And I wanted to talk about that because I don't know if in the exhibition is very clear. You know, I didn't saw the exhibition, but usually when we talk about the artists, we didn't think we don't think about the critics. And they were very important critics for all these artists that you are showing. Yeah, no, thank you for, for bringing this to light for us, because I think, uh, yeah, maybe, you know, when you work on an exhibition, you you make choices. And I would say okay. the role of the of the critics is not um, is not shown uh, as as you do here in, in your presentation. And I think this is extremely important. What you said about the government pushing forward this idea of of modern art, not having God, as you said, modern art as apolitical versus mm -hmm. these artists, these art critics pushing another discourse. Uh, about an avant-garde being linked to uh, to society and and the role. so I, I found this was extremely clear. Like that also illuminated for me uh, some questions I still had even having worked on the topic. This is a very complex uh, artistic panorama. But thank you for showing also the the again the collaboration of of these artists and how how collaborative this whole project uh, was at the time of artist critics. Uh, working together. Uh, this was extremely interesting. I have to say that, of course, the, co the collaboration has some limits because, for example, Equipo, Equipo 57, where, of course, they did whatever they want, but they were very close. Sometimes with the art critics were part of the teams, they were like uh, there in a kind of conversation. I didn't want to present the art critics as the, the only 
figure and the, the paternal figure, they were, they, sometimes they were, uh, they had disagreements, but it was quite important, I think, for all of them to have this kind of debate that it was difficult at the time in Spain, that it was uh, very slowly modern art could enter into Spanish society. So this kind of groups, I think, came naturally, I mean. Well, unfortunately, yeah. our, our time has come to an end, but I'd like to thank you, Paula, and I, I, I'd like to read um, one comment that we have that, that I echo. Um, so in the chat box, someone wrote, thank you for such a brilliant presentation of something new to me, so energizing. So thank you very much for bringing some energy to all of us on, on this Tuesday. Um, we really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Have a lovely day. You too. Take Thank care. Bye-bye.